What's going on guys? My name is Wade with Tech Daily. So Samsung releases a lot of phones throughout the year. There's pretty much a device for every price point when you consider all the A series, F series, M series, and S series phones that are out there. I bet you didn't even know about some of these. But within that huge lineup, there are a few phones that don't really make much sense. And this A24 is the one that stands out to me as the most unnecessary. I think the purpose of the A24 is to offer non-5G markets, a device that's slightly better than budget. This phone is arguably a couple steps above the A14 4G LTE, but is still quite affordable, well under $200 now. I would imagine utilizing older, cheaper, non-5G capable components like the MediaTek Helio G99 helps keep that cost down. And I also suspect that since there are parts of the world, even some areas of the US, that aren't fully 5G ready still, Samsung feels some type of way selling or advertising 5G devices when not all of their customers can utilize that network band. But nowadays, there's really no need to make a distinction between 4G LTE only devices and 5G capable devices. Even in the most tech savvy 5G cities, we don't get 5G coverage all the time. Furthermore, the transition from 2G to 3G and then to 4G didn't see phones carry those network names for more than a year or two. Yet the first mainstream 5G phone was Samsung's S10 back in 2019. And for some reason, more than four years later now, Samsung still explicitly names a lot of their phones 5G and still sells 4G LTE only phones. It's like they're still not quite ready to fully commit. Or maybe the average customer still has questions about 5G phones and 5G networks, so there needs to still be that distinction to prompt a proper explanation from carriers. Or maybe, and this is just my theory, Samsung has a lot of leftover parts and pieces, so they create a Frankenstein phone to fill any extra gaps in their ridiculously large smartphone lineup, so that every customer between $100 and $1,000 can get a Samsung. I mean, there'd be nothing wrong with just having an A14, A34, and an A54, right? As you contemplate that, I want to take a quick second to thank this video's sponsor, Ranvu. You guys know that I've been staying cool this summer with my Ranvu Ice 3 portable neck fan, and now that the colder months are fast approaching, it's time to switch to the Ice 3's heating mode. Ranvu's Ice 3 is an automated AI-powered cooling and heating wearable with additional health and wellness capabilities. For its heating and cooling modes, it has four Ice Max engines with seven upward and downward air ducts that blow a constant stream of air all around you. There's also four semiconductors within the neck band itself that can get both cold and warm to the touch, and altogether, it allows you to stay perfectly cool or cozy and warm no matter the temperature around you. The Ice 3 is a full-color touchscreen built in for controlling everything, and you'll notice that the Ice 3 also tracks other health metrics like your heart rate, steps, and blood oxygen level. It's basically an all-in-one health and wellness device to not just keep your body temperature regulated, but also keep track of your well-being. And best of all, the Ice 3 is AI-powered, so if it senses that you're warm or that it's a bit cold out, it can automatically start cooling you down or warming you up. It takes into account the ambient temperature and various body measurements to give you exactly what you need. As we head into the fall and winter months, I'm definitely going to be taking advantage of the Ice 3's heating modes now especially, and if you're interested in staying warm too, you can get the Ice 3 for $30 off right now on Amazon. Now to Samsung's credit, they absolutely could have just used last year's design and plastic housing on this A24, but they didn't. This phone has the same new redesign that all the A series phones got this year. Now at a glance, it pretty much mimics even Samsung's flagship phone design. Also, based on the very precise to the middle meter measurements, the size of this phone is different from all the others. So Samsung seems to have specifically made at least the rear housing and frame for this A24 only. And I should also say that I love this finish. It's officially just called silver, but it's a metallic, holographic, shiny, color-shifting deal that's probably my favorite colorway on any Samsung phone. And this does come on a couple other A-series devices this year, too. From the front, unfortunately, this phone looks like every A-series phone from like the last three or four years. And this is where Samsung did seemingly reuse not just the design language, but 
probably some of the parts and pieces too. It's a standard issue 6.5 inch screen framed by a notched selfie camera and thick black borders that yield you barely an 82% screen to body ratio. It looks dated and budget and it feels way bigger in the hand with all that border bulk. This is a phone that honestly looks better from the back than it does from the front. One thing that Samsung continued to do with these A series phones though is keep the ancient add-ons that they took away from the flagships. This phone has dual physical SIM support and micro SD card support and the headphone jack. And it's not like you get no storage. The A24 has 128 gigs for you to use up front. The odd physical bit on this phone actually is the power button. It's like this weirdly clicky, almost hollow sounding or extra plasticky button. It still works just fine as a fingerprint sensor button combo, but it's a little jarring since it doesn't match any other Samsung phone I've tried. So I already mentioned that the display on this phone is more or less what we've seen in the past, and that holds true when we dive deeper with the specs. It's a full HD 2340 by 1080 resolution Super AMOLED 90 Hz screen with a supposed 1000 nits of peak brightness. And what Samsung winds up doing here to differentiate all these A-series phones is they sort of go one pip up or down with the screen specs. So for example, this A24 is an AMOLED panel, while the A14 is LCD. This A24 has a 90 hertz refresh rate, while the A34 is 120 hertz. Depending on what you've used or what you like to experience visually, these minor differences may or may not be significant or even noticeable. I think the difference between 90 and 120 hertz is tough to discern, but an AMOLED screen like this one certainly yields you a bolder, brighter, more vibrant look compared to LCD, with far less glare too. But these are all relatively minor differences across a half a dozen different Samsung phones that nowadays don't really need to be so subtly different. A standard issue 1080 resolution AMOLED screen with at least a 90 hertz refresh rate should be on even the cheapest of cheap phones. Or, rather than trying to differentiate a half a dozen phones with minor little spec discrepancies, they should just make less phones. This A24 delivers a fine viewing experience for what it is, but it's not particularly unique and doesn't offer any higher value for the price. It's just pretty basic. Then there's the internal specs and overall performance. Now earlier, I alluded to the fact that this phone's processor is sort of old news. The MediaTek Helio G99 is a one and a half year old mid-tier non-5G capable chip. What Samsung did is basically cram in last year's processor into this year's phone, presumably to save money. And last year's Helio G99 isn't particularly remarkable either. The Geekbench scores show that it can handle a lot, even the crappiest of crappy scam games with annoying ads and miserable graphics, but it's still a mid-tier chip. Furthermore, the base level configuration on this phone, what most people will probably buy, only comes with four gigabytes of RAM, like the one I have here. The issue with this stems from the fact that Samsung explicitly chose for this phone not to be 5G capable, to not have a newer 5G ready processor and internals, but they didn't opt for like the best non 5G internals. They didn't value add by giving this phone better than average specs or more RAM or even a bigger battery. And if they're gonna go backwards and find old components to use, why not use a two or three year old flagship Snapdragon processor instead? I'm sure people would be thrilled by that. You can actually get a Samsung S20 right now for the same price as this phone. The benefit, I guess, to getting a newer phone like this A24 is software. You should still get a couple of more years of major Android updates and Samsung One UI add-ons, but this phone to me just feels like Samsung didn't really try to offer anything unique or special or of any particular value. It's like a bland combination of mediocre parts that make up a phone that purposely lacks network capabilities that very few people really fully utilize, and the rest of the phone kind of seems to suffer because of that. And I mentioned battery, yeah, this phone has a 5,000 milliamp battery inside, which is pretty big, but so do all the other Samsung A-series phones this year. And the one pip up feature-wise compared to the lesser A14 is faster charging. This phone supports 25 watt wired speeds, but you don't get the proper plug in the box. So chances are most everyone will be using their ancient USB-A wall plugs they've been carrying around for years. 
and not actually getting those faster charging speeds. I still don't understand why Samsung doesn't just encourage everyone to buy and use the best charger possible for their phones. Finally, when it comes to the camera setup, this is another area of the phone where Samsung plays around with these minor, minute little spec differences that only barely differentiate the A-series lineup. In this case, the A24 gets the same 50 megapixel main lens that the lesser A14s have, and the same useless two megapixel macro for up-close pics. The extra special bonus is a five megapixel ultra-wide lens that's actually in the regular A14 as well, but not in the A14 5G. Confusing, I know. The selfie camera on almost all these A-series phones is the same though, a 13 megapixel shooter. And inside the camera app, you get just slightly more than the bare essentials to take some decent pics. But you'll notice a lot of limitations compared to even a $400 phone. There's no 4K video, the selfie camera has just 1080, 30 FPS, and you get the basic set of extras that have been on most A-series phones for about the last three years. Is the camera setup special, unique, or even that much better than the A14 or A14 5G? Not really, though you could argue that maybe this is an aspect of this phone that is slightly worse in a more significant way than the A34 or A54. I'll give you that much at least. To me, the A24 just attempts to fill a gap in Samsung's smartphone lineup that doesn't really exist. I firmly believe, for one, that there's no reason to sell a non-5G phone nowadays. So what if some parts of the world don't fully support 5G network capabilities? Phones support all sorts of network bands, 3G, 4G, LTE, ultra wideband, and we've never had such a long transition with such an emphasis on the naming scheme and compatibility like we've had with 5G. I also don't think Samsung needs to have so many phones in their lineup. There are eight different A-series phones that I know of at least this year. We could get away with like three and they all could be 5G capable, but just drop the 5G in the name. And I'd also like to see some bigger differences between them all too. I'm not entirely sure what those differences should be, B, that's up to Samsung to figure out with some new features or better specs. But I think overall, this A24 is probably a phone that doesn't need to exist, and I wouldn't be surprised to see Samsung drop it completely next year, like they did with the A34 4G and the A43 5G and some other devices that sort of got lost in their lineup. So those are my thoughts on the A24. What do you guys think? Did you buy this phone? Did you even know Samsung offered it? Let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts, of course. Hopefully you guys did enjoy this video though. Be sure to follow Tech Daily on Twitter and subscribe to the Tech Daily YouTube channel if you haven't already. I'll see you guys later.